Our main speaker today is a songwriter, a speaker, a business professional, and a member of Houston Oasis. And uh, she and her husband Will and Will's son played for us uh, with their band uh, Snake Charmers just a few weeks ago and they were awesome. Uh, and today we welcome her back as our main speaker. Please give a warm welcome to Marie Angel. Free this microphone from its chains. I'm gonna make a little noise while I'm doing. Okay, I'll just cover it up with, with uh, blah blah blah. Uh, today I'm also joined by my son Travis, Travis Blumentritt, who is uh, my AV guy, my tech support. Without him, I would uh, be lost when it comes to the world of computing. And let's see, I'm already lost. Sorry. Can everybody see the screen? That's important. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. right. Here we go. I'm going to I control it. He set this up with a Wii remote, so that's how tech he is. Today, the internet taught me that Taco Cat backwards spells Taco Cat. <laughs> How many of you like that? <laughs> that feeling, did you feel it? That little feeling that, that you liked it and I liked it, that you liked it. That was one second of love right there. That's a little jolt of dopamine going through our brains. Whoops, that is the wrong slide. Um, these are out of order, Trev. I mean, the third one. Okay, well, anyway, sorry, technical difficulties. Well, we spend, I'll just skip on, we spend 16 minutes of every hour in the US on average on social media. That's a lot of. That's 960 seconds, potentially, of love. <laughs> and that is a lot of love. And indeed, I'm still trapped here. There is another side to this. And we have some players who will enact that for us. Right now, I'm right here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> This is a well-oiled machine we've got here. This is, I'll set the scene for you. This is if there were links in real life. We're at Tom's Coffee Shop, right here. Can everybody see? We're at Tom's Coffee Shop near Columbia University where Neil is having a talk face to face with his old college buddy Rob. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> it's so great to sit down with you in a real coffee shop and just talk. I miss our talks together, you know, back in college. Now all we do is talk to each other on Facebook. It's great to hang out with you again, Neil. You wanted to talk about something, Neil? <laughs> yeah, I feel a little sad lately. <laughs> I, uh, I just feel a little sad lately. It's uh, finally hitting me, you know, like I'm alone. Like, I have finally moved on from Sophia and Julie, but yet I really haven't moved on at all. So are you depressed? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Have you ever read the bloggers? She writes about depression, how depression lies. Here's a link to one of her posts. Yeah, I've read her, but that's a different type of depression. I'm not really in the mood to read right now. But she's so funny. This one post, it's not about depression. It's called Cat Water Beds for Everyone. It's hilarious. Here's the link. <laughs> Not in the mood for funny today. Hmm. 
Do you know, the best thing ever written about depression was by Ali Brosh from Hyperbole and <laughs> Half. Where's the link? <laughs> okay, look, I'm not sure it's depression. And I don't want to read anything. I just want to hang out with you, have a real connection. I already spend too much time online. Okay, sure. I, I hear you. You know, it's like maybe I'll never find love again. I mean, I know it's not true, but I'm kind of feeling it in my gut. Uh, pardon me, I don't want to interrupt, but since I'm overhearing your conversation, but I'm not listening very closely, <laughs> I just want to tell you, I'm on my fifth date since breaking up with my wife of 15 years. And here's a link to my article on the Huffington Post. <laughs> How I got back into my groove after 15 years of marriage. Look, I know you guys are trying to help, but I just want to hear what you think. Do you ever have this feeling that your heart is breaking? That love is slipping away, like time is... I'm Joseph, your server today. But before I take your order, I have to tell you that your heartbreaking is inconsequential to the suffering of the Israeli genocide in Gaza. <laughs> so you can educate yourself at my blog. Here's the link. All right, now, who would like to hear about our specials? <laughs> Thank you to our players, Mike House, Ken Ismert, Eric Anderson, and Brian Schrock. They did a great job. Yeah. That did not feel so much like a second of love. And that's something that really hit me when I read this. I, uh, Neil, I know Neil, who wrote this, Neil Kramer. He has a blog at Citizen of the Month. <laughs> <laughs> Neil is, uh, is a writer, and I did ask him if I could uh, have permission to use his work. And when I wrote him a message through Facebook, my autocorrect changed the word social to suicidal. <laughs> and he said that I could use the play if I said that. <laughs> Because there's a lot of truth to that. There is a lot of truth that the internet is not all all cats and dopamine until somebody gets hurt. And we see that, we see that publicly with real suicides, with cyberbullying, with Gamergate. Those of you who are not familiar with Gamergate, that's the extreme harassment by trolls, internet trolls, people who make comments that are vicious and threatening to particularly women in the video game industry. So those things are going on and that's the dark side of social media. We don't see necessarily the side where people are hurt, where people have their depression and loneliness exacerbated by seeing all the wonderful things that they perceive that their peers are doing. And that reinforces those feelings of alienation. And that can lead to, to problems in life, to, to feeling like you're at a party where everyone is dressed beautifully, they have the fabulous lives, they're all Nobel Prize winners, and you're sitting in the corner in your sweatpants. And we also see the other side of that, which is the pressure that we may feel to present that good face to the world, to show us that we're doing, everyone that we're doing great, everything is wonderful, but not necessarily the parts of our lives where it's not so good. And that can lead to what's often called smiling depression. I'm gonna see if I've got the, uh, yeah, I think we're back in order here. Okay, sorry. Social scientists have said that it's demonstrably true that we don't have as much empathy when we're interacting online. I think that's probably something that we could have figured out without social scientists. But what they've also learned is that the mere presence of a phone or a tablet on the table or in the hand of someone reduces their empathy. And in fact, the conclusion is that 
Our phones make us physically present, but emotionally absent. But I like the way Louis C.K. puts it, who's a comedian. He says that kids don't build empathy when they have a phone in their hand. They look at a kid in person and they can say, you're fat, and they see the face crunch up, and they get that reaction. But on social media, they don't see that. That feeling of, ooh, that doesn't feel so good, doesn't register. They just go, <clears throat> that was fun. This is, this is the dark side. I'm licking my finger, sorry people. And conversely, <laughs> social media for most of us is not that big of a problem. We enjoy it, we make a connection. But what we also find is that it's a portal through which most of us enter, but few exit, because social media is the gateway to that instant fix of dopamine, that one second of love. And we get that feeling of connection with people, and it's always there. It's always available with the distractions that we crave when we're bored or we're frustrated or we're trying to kill some time. And then, we feel like we have gotten a lot done because we are multitasking. We are pushing buttons, we are clicking on things, we are liking, we are in it. And that's not necessarily such a bad thing except then the distractions equal your quality of work suffers. That's not really a surprise either because we obviously, if we're not attentive, we make more mistakes, tasks take longer to finish, but interestingly, they found that the very quality of your words suffers. We write fewer words, which might be fine, except when the quality is lower, then we're not clear. So combined with the mistakes, bad things can happen. And if, on top of that, you're checking your device every second, you're stealing resources from decision-making you may need later, which might affect your home life, your relationships. And you don't want to bleed your brain to death tweet by tweet. <laughs> the zombie apocalypse may be upon us. So this doesn't this make you feel like you want to just rise up and take your phone out of your pocket and your tablet out of your case and just fling it into the ocean. <laughs> I heard some no's because, yeah, not so fast because social media is not going anywhere soon. We all use it, or most of us do, and, and it's a useful tool. We shouldn't blame the tool for our own reaction to it. I know Neil Kramer because of Twitter. I keep up with my family and friends through Facebook. I have met people online that I then became good friends with in real life. I found out about Oasis through social media. So that's the good side and that's the useful side. So how do we balance, how do we figure out how to deal with social media in our lives because it is something new that, as humans, we haven't encountered before. Well, this is one way. We have to recognize that digital connection should enhance, but not replace, real life connections. Because it's the real life connections that ultimately are what make the difference in our lives. That is the key to happiness in the modern world. Yay! <laughs> Hooray! Hooray! But not only that, but wait! <laughs> Social connections equal success. And not just because your dad went to Harvard with the other guy who's now the CEO. No. Social connection is the greatest predictor of happiness. Happiness is the greatest predictor of success. They tested this with salespeople. 
because it's not it's easy to measure sales and they found that people who were the happiest and they measured that through optimism through their social connections they sold the most and they did best even in times when the recession came and other people weren't selling the ones who were the happiness happiest were the most successful so yay for happiness so what's the best way to achieve happiness and success well you move to a village not necessarily literally but figuratively because in a village you meet face to face you get oxytocin and neurotransmitters and a little bit more of that dopamine and you positively affect your health and well-being we know that people who do not have social connections are unhealthy in comparison to the rest of the population and they die sooner stay alive by joining a cohesive community where there are helping hands for the young and the old and problems that people have in life and the village not only has a positive effect for people in need but by helping out people who need you and you have a social connection with you will feel like you belong and you will be healthier and happier too that's the village effect which is a very interesting book by the way that is coming out shortly so that's the best way to balance your life with social media to use those tools and I, this, I, I, I want to get the full impact of this to use these tools of social media and to have real life connections and how do we do that how have we done that yes <laughs> how did you know <laughs> this is what oasis is creating oasis is creating a community of real connection and we use social media tools to keep informed, to connect with each other, and to facilitate that real life connection, which is why we need a place. So as a friend of mine said, Oasis, a better place. We're going to a better place. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks so much to Travis. And